So, what we'll be looking at uh, this afternoon, two parts, uh, today and tomorrow, we have to acknowledge we're not really in a post-Brexit period yet, but we're getting very close to that time when Britain uh, will leave the EU. And what we're seeing is the preparation that Europe is making for that time when Britain is no longer attached to the EU and acting as a break to her ambitious ideas. And already we can see the pattern that is emerging in Europe as they seek to forge a unity, a United States of Europe is what scripture leads us to expect, as we shall see in a moment. And it is uh, a, a wonderful thing to behold. Now, we must be aware that we don't have to see all the final stages before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think if we put scripture together, it tells us that the Lord Jesus comes back, first of all, to his household to call the saints to judgment. And then, I believe, uh, Leviticus 23 indicates to us probably a period of 10 years before uh, the Battle of Armageddon. So quite a lot of events can take place during that period when Christ is back on the earth in secret with his household. The Elijah work that Malachi chapter 4 talks about can take place. So we are very close, brothers and sisters, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this should put us on our mettle and make us alert to see the signs that God has given us of the nearness of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of necessity, I have to be fairly brief on the scriptural contents in these talks, but in Milestones, I did this time uh, go very comprehensively into a lot of scriptures which indicate to us the steps that we should be expecting. And if any of you haven't got a copy of Milestones, uh, I have got some copies here. Just come and help yourself. So... I don't know what went wrong there. Let's go back to... That's right. So what we're basically looking at in our two parts, today's and tomorrow's, is really uh, covered by the two pictures which I chose to put on the front cover of this year's Milestones. The top picture is the Daily Telegraph's cartoonist depiction of uh, Juncter's State of the Union speech, which he made in September of last year, when he made it clear that Europe was now, have got the opportunity to forge ahead, to unite, to have build an army, and to become an independent power, independent of Britain, independent of America. And the Daily Telegraph cartoonist depicted him as a Roman emperor, speaking to his people. And there's a great irony about that because that's what scripture talks about. It talks about in the latter days, as we shall see in a moment when we look at Daniel chapter 2, the legs, the iron, mixed with clay, but there is this link with Rome, with the iron of Rome. So we're going to look at Europe and a bit of Brexit, and then hopefully tomorrow, God willing, We'll look at the outcome from Trump's declaration that the embassy, U.S. embassy, should move to Jerusalem, uh, and the many changes that have taken place in the Middle East in the past year or two. And again, it's going the way that Scripture has uh, indicated to us, so it is very exciting. Now, there is a great rift growing between America and Europe, and this was on the occasion, 7th of July, this is the front cover of the Economist magazine. Uh, this was the time when Trump came to Britain and then went to the NATO meeting, and it was quite clear to the leaders of Europe that there was a growing rift between their outlook uh, and America's outlook. If we just look more closely at that cartoon, it very skillfully, I have great admiration for cartoonists who can just with a few pen strokes well, not that it took him a few pen strokes, there's quite a lot of strokes there, but can so wonderfully just put this concept of this break, this rift between America and Europe. And again, this is something we've been looking for for a long, long time. The uh, Daniel's 
image has uh, Europe united together without America being there. America and Britain have a different role to play in opposition to the uh, standing up of Daniel's image, Nebuchadnezzar's image. So this is exciting times. It is clear to everybody uh, that uh, there is this rift. And in, on the continent, the cartoonists have been uh, very strong in portraying this gulf that is growing. And uh, there's just a list of some of the different covers on the Spiegel, which is one of the main magazines in Germany, that have shown that uh, there's no love lost between the two. And Stern, um, their uh, recent cover, uh, showed him as a, a Nazi with a salute, which seems a most strange uh, thing. But just at the bottom there, in 2000, 80% of the Germans said they felt favourable about the US. By 2015, the number had fallen to 50. By spring 2017, it was only 35. So in the same year, another poll found that the Germans... More Germans trusted Russia than the United States. And the editor of Spiegel has written a book and is thanking uh, Mr. Trump for causing this rift between the continents because he wants Germany to be the dominant power uh, under leadership in Europe without the help of uh, the Americans. And so again, at the bottom, the cracks in the transatlantic relations caused by Trump, Donald Trump's election provide an opportunity for Germany to finally forge ahead with its own foreign policy, he wrote in, back in April. And uh, it's an extremely good opportunity, a wake-up call. I cannot imagine a better motivation than this shock from Trump, because Trump said, unless you pay into NATO, NATO's not going to defend you. Perhaps America had to pay the price for Europe to wake up and become resilient. Perhaps we should now shout, thanks, Donald. And just this weekend, uh, Putin has been to Germany to speak with uh, Angela Merkel, and between them they are planning the future for a Europe without American involvement. They've been talking about the Nord Stream, the gas pipeline that... Germany and Russia are wanting to build, uh, which will make Germany even in a stronger position because you'll have almost total control with the gas that comes into Europe. They're talking about the rebuilding of Syria. Uh, and again, uh, America's being excluded from those plans that Russia has for the rebuilding of Syria. And it is so interesting to see how Russia and Europe coming together. Uh, again, that's what Daniel's image would expect us to understand. So let's just now briefly just turn the spotlight. These are passages that you know very well on uh, what the Bible has to say about the latter day situation. Because we are living in the latter days, there are so many prophecies. Daniel chapter 2, Ezekiel 38, Joel chapter 3, Zechariah 12 and 13, as well as Revelation 16, which all concentrate upon this time period. So we've got lots of information as to what saints should be looking out for. Um, we know that in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, that it stands upon iron clay feet. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that's what we're seeing being formed before our eyes, the feet. The head came and went, and the body and the, the legs have come and gone. But we're now in the final stage, the feet stage. But in some wonderful way, the whole edifice it is all linked together. So that when the feet are formed, then the image can stand upon its feet for the first and only time. And it stands upon its feet in order to come against Israel and against Egypt. So we see the preparations now and the cooperation in Europe and Russia for the coming together of a power, a world power, that is opposed to what they see happening in Israel. The return of the Jews, the Jewish state being established, and now the declaration that this is a homeland for the Jews. And this is going to cause the nations to come against uh, 
the nation of Israel to destroy it. And we know they'll succeed for a short period of time before the Lord Jesus and the saints come to uh, intervene in the affairs of men and destroy the Gogian forces. So what is depicted in the latter days is that we have, borrowing the language of Revelation chapter 16, we have a beast power and we have a dragon power and we have a false prophet power. And those we have to fit in with the same picture that is being given in Daniel chapter 2. And so we see the beast as represented by the western foot, the dragon, Russia, by the eastern foot, and the false prophet by the golden head, the Babylonian head with its eyes and mouth, uh, directing op operations, as it were. Now we know that the two legs represented the power of Rome, the east and western branches of the Roman Empire, and they lingered on for a long, long time. And in fact, didn't finally come to an end until World War I, just a hundred years ago. So the last Habsburg monarch was Charles I, uh, and then the leg power, the emperors, the Holy Roman Empire came to its absolute end. We know how Hitler tried to establish a, a recreation of the Holy Roman Empire, but he was before his time. But he laid the foundations for the EU uh, as we have it now. But because Britain chose to join the EU 43, 44 years ago now, um, this was uh, God's means of holding back the developments. The time hadn't yet come for Europe to develop in its final phase of the beast system. And I believe that now we're getting Britain coming out, that we will see quite rapidly this development of the last phase of the um, beast system. It's perhaps not true to say the last phase because there are two more phases to come, the, the iron clay feet, and Revelation, which is, tells us of uh, Europe before Armageddon, that brings the image down to uh, the land of Israel. But Revelation 6, 17 tells us of the final forming when the power of Russia has been broken on the mountains of Israel uh, and Europe rallies together to resist the uh, demands from Israel, from Zion, when the Lord Jesus as king demands the uh, submission of all nations. So we're in interesting times for the beast to grow. And if we look on the eastern leg, we have a very similar situation. Came to then exactly the same time, 1918, when the Tsar Nicholas II was murdered. And again, God put communism into place to hold back the development of Russia. And it wasn't until uh, 1991, when communism was overthrown, that we began to re-emerge uh, the, the leg power, the foot uh, of the uh, image in Russia. And we see the very close involvement of the Russian church with political matters. And Putin himself models his, what he does on Tsar Peter the Great. And so we're getting a, a recreation of a situation that existed in the past with the uh, two legs. We've now got two feet forming after a period of God holding back because the time hadn't come. Now the time has come. We shall see great developments on both sides. So we're told that the feet uh, consist of uh, potter's clay and iron, a, a, a divided kingdom, strength of iron, because you saw iron mixed with miry clay. So partly strong, partly broken is what we're told. It's an impossible mix, isn't it? This image stands upon feet, which are a mixture of iron and clay, an impossible mixture. But we see, we know what iron stands for. It stands for the power of Rome, doesn't it? Because that's what was represented by the legs, the two legs, iron uh, representing Rome. And so we see in uh, the two legs, the two feet, sorry, uh, the power of Rome in the Roman Catholic Church 
or in Russia, in the Russian Orthodox Church, being very much as the basis of how things are organised. We can see it much clearly, more clearly in Russia than we do in Europe, because that's still in development. But Clay points to democracy, to people. Adam was created from the clay. Now, this is something peculiar to this generation, that we have both in Europe and we have in Russia a mixture of uh, authoritarianism, the inner circle of the EU who pass all the laws, and yet there, are, uh, de- there is a veneer of democracy with the um, elections, uh, and the elections aren't the next year. Um, so, but, you know, it's, it's a strange mixture. And we have exactly the same in Russia. Putin holds almost absolute power, but he has been elected there. There is a Duma, there is a parliament there. So very much uh, an expression of the times of today when there's this hard authoritarian rule uh, and very much that links back to the power of the churches. So this is the situation we are in the forming of the iron clay feet. And what we're seeing happening in Europe and in the ex-Soviet satellite states are nations being drawn into the correct foot because the dividing line, if we take the old dividing line between the uh, Roman Empire, East and West in the past, indicates that countries like uh, Cyprus and Greece and Turkey belong to the Russian foot, uh, not to the uh, Western foot. And so we're getting these tensions in the countries in that region as they get pulled. And Russia is doing her best to pull countries like Greece and Cyprus and Turkey uh, her way, uh, and the EU is uh, struggling to resist that. But we see under the current Pope uh, a great power to change Europe. We don't see much in the British papers about it, but if one looks at the continental papers and see what they say, there is very definitely a great trend in Europe now to turn back from the atheism that has swept Europe, uh, to come back to the Catholic roots of Europe, mainly as a stay against the heavy... uh, almost invasion of the Muslims into Europe. Uh, And the Europeans can see that unless we have a strong church uh, and Europe has uh, recognises Christianity as its basis, we will be overwhelmed by the Muslims. So it's interesting, just this time when we have this influx of Muslims coming in, which is causing Europe to sit up and take steps. Now, one of the things that we see is Europe wanting to have its own army. And again, reading scripture, that is what we would expect. If we uh, think of Daniel chapter 2, they're going to come against Israel. Uh, and that image is to come and bring its armies against the nation of Israel. Well, Russia's got its army, but Europe hasn't got an army, or very little army. So in order for the two feet to bring their armies to Israel against uh, the nation of Israel, we would expect that Europe needs to have an army. And this is what has been the talk the last uh, 12 months about Europe now having the opportunity to have their army. And when we come to Revelation chapter 16, again we have a similar picture that the beast and the dragon, the false prophet, uh, they are working to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, which again would indicate to us that these must be military powers in the latter days who can gather to that great battle in the land of Israel. So we would expect the European beast to have an army, like Russia has an army, not so powerful. Russia is the one that uh, is the head of the uh, military might that goes against Israel but we'd expect that Europe will have at least a token army to go and assist them. And in chapter 17, it talks about Europe, that the armies of Europe make war with the Lamb, 
and the lamb overcomes them. So again, another indication that we should expect to see military power in Europe. Now, we have to link all that and the iron and the church with the situation that has been happening. And recently, there have been elections uh, back in October of last year in Austria. And it's brought this young man, Kurtz, to the fore. He's the youngest chancellor that Austria has ever had. He's only 31. And he is a staunch uh, Roman Catholic. And he is very interested in Austria and going back and having uh, an emperor. He talks about the... Um, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that the Holy Roman Empire merged into uh, and came to an end in World War I. So he's quite keen on the Catholic roots uh, and restoring an emperorship to the situation. Now, whether that will ever happen, we don't know, but it would be very interesting if there was an emperor restored uh, in uh, Austria or Germany. Um, we know Russia. There was quite a movement in Russia uh, for a similar thing, the restoration of the monarchy. Uh, the people are already there. Uh, it's whether the people will it. But he took over in July the um, six-monthly presidency of the um, European Council. So every six months, one of the 28 uh, member countries supplies their leader as the president for the six months. And so he started his stint in July, runs through to December. And one of the things that he is calling for, his slogan, is a Europe that protects. In other words, a Europe that looks inwards, very much like America. America for America, Americans. So in his uh, plan that he set out for his presidency, his six months, it was a Europe that protects, a fight against illegal immigration, securing prosperity and competitiveness through digitalization and stability in the European neighborhood. Uh, and he uses this word, oops, press the right button, subsidiarity, devolving power down which very much is a, a word that is used by the Roman Catholic Church. They have their Pope, who is the head, but power is devolved downwards to each country with its uh, archbishop and then the bishops and the priests. And what Austria remembers is, they have a long stretch of history, is the events of 1683 when the uh, Ottoman Turks, having overthrown Constantinople, 1453, they then expanded their empire and came right up to the um, walls of Vienna, where the Holy Roman Emperor was, and uh, it, it besieged it. And they nearly succeeded in taking Vienna. The emperor uh, rallied the troops, uh, for, um, from other countries and uh, they came and saved Vienna in the nick of time and in fact the preventing of the Muslims taking Vienna was really the beginning of the downfall of the Ottoman Empire which we see is now shrunk back to Turkey uh, a long process of time um, but this was the, the uh, peak of the empire when it got up to Vienna, but it was driven back. And he, he hearkens back to this time. This is what we've got to do. We've got to gather together. We've got to defend ourselves against these Muslim powers who are wanting to take over. And this was uh, an article just last week. One of the EU founders, uh, Otto Habsburg, who's now dead, said the European community is living largely by the heritage of the Holy Roman Empire. Well, the great majority of people who live by it don't know by what heritage they live. And the comment was made under Chancellor Kurtz, this Holy Roman Empire heritage is again gaining em emphasis. And interestingly, uh, Kurtz has, um, in cooperation with the 
uh, Imperial Museum in Vienna has from July to December, to coincide with his presidency, arranged special tours to show the uh, imperial treasures which are stored in that museum. That's the original imperial crown that was used to crown the emperors from the 11th century onwards. And then from the 15th century, when Austria became uh, a power, then the crown and the scepter and the orb uh, these are on show, and a great emphasis is being made. This is our roots. We, Holy Roman Empire, get back to that. Germany, too, is very keen to uh, see a re-establishment of the church. Now, Germany is divided between Catholic and Lutheran. And what has happened in the past 20, 30 years, uh, under the influence of the Jes Jesuits, that the Protestants have caved in. And they're now looking to Rome as the mother church. The daughters are wanting to go back to the mother. And so we're seeing an interesting time in Germany where Catholics and Protestants are meeting together and wanting to share fellowship together. Uh, again, I think this is a step which will build Germany up as a strong power with Catholic influence. Now, if we look at Germany, who is the undisputed leader of the EU, uh, as far as population is concerned, she is the biggest country of the, a member of the EU by quite a, a margin. Uh, she also is the strongest um, economy. Uh, she is number four in the world for GDP, which is a measure of the country's wealth um, and is the leader in the EU. And if we look at exports, she is number two in the world behind the United States. Um, Sorry, this is gold reserves. So the, the, the next one is the export. This is gold reserves. She has huge gold reserves for a fairly small country so that uh, in time of emergency, she has the backing of gold. So, yes, exports. Uh, she's number three in the world behind China, United States, and then Germany. So, again, an amazing power because she was 70, 80 years ago, was absolutely driven into the ground, but now she has emerged as a strong power. And I think that Brexit has played, that's God's use of uh, events, um, Brexit is making Europe feel she's able to stand on her own feet. Now, it's very interesting that the continental cartoonists depict Brexit as Europe sailing away from Britain. Um, this was from his uh, State of the Union speech last September. The wind is in our sails. Let's speed up the pace. Turn the fan on. Let's move away from Britain uh, even faster. Whereas uh, in this country, we regard Brexit as Britain sailing away from the continent. Two different outlooks, but it just indicates the gulf that is growing. We've seen the evidence of that in the failure of the talks that have been between the two sides. So uh, we're in this interesting period of negotiations. The Brexit vote uh, back in 2016, uh, on the 29th of March uh, last year, the Article 50 was triggered, which gives us this two year period to the 29th of March next year. But as far as the EU is concerned, October is the deadline for talks and negotiations because whatever is agreed, if anything is going to be agreed, uh, has to go back to the member countries and be discussed and uh, talked through. Uh, and if one member nation doesn't agree with whatever has been agreed, if anything is agreed, uh, then the whole lot collapses. So. There's a very tight, we're, not, we're in August, September, October is, is looming very close. 
But just go back and see what Europe has been doing in that period when Britain's been going round and round and round in circles and not really getting anywhere. So the Article 50 was triggered the 29th of March, just uh, four years earlier, whilst the 60th birthday party of the um, EU, uh, and they made the Rome Declaration, which uh, Britain obviously didn't attend because uh, they knew that they were just about to art um, trigger Article 50. But the nations of Europe, the other 27 members, declared that they were going to be united, they were going to politically come together as one country, and the idea of having their army was something that was floated there. And we just move on uh, six months or so to the 13th of September last year. Juncker gave his State of the Union speech, uh, and again he was saying, um, well, well, we'll come to this, let's just go through these things. So State of the Union speech, uh, a couple of weeks later, France, Macron gave his speech. Uh, in November, the EU leaders uh, said they will set up PESCO, which we'll look at what PESCO means, but that's to do with their army. Um, then uh, 19th of January of this year, Macron and Merkel meet together to celebrate the 55th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty and again say we're going to work together to be the powerhouse that moves Europe to unite and have an army. <laughs> Uh, Munich Security Conference on the 16th of February said similar things. We're here to have our own army. First meeting of PESCO, beginning of March. Uh, middle of June, the EU Defence Fund was set up. Never before in the EU budget has there been a budget for defence. Vast sums of money being poured into a defence fund. Uh, and so, you know, a lot has been happening so what does PESCO mean? Well, in Italian, it means a peach tree. And the, uh, the cynics say, well, that's soft on the outside, but very hard on the inside, a stony heart, and that's very much is the EU. But it stands for Permanent Structured Cooperation. Problem is that each EU member country has its own military power, its own types of planes and tanks and that kind of thing. Uh, and so many different weapon systems compared with America, which has unified things. And this uh, chart, which uh, appeared in an article last week, um, I know the writing's pretty small, but um, sets out the matters. So the EU has a population of 530 million. United States, uh, only 327 million. Uh, EU spends 1.3% uh, of its GDP America 3.3, um, investment per soldier 27,000 euros, 108,000 euros. Uh, they have 178 different weapon systems, uh, America only has 30. 17 different tanks, America one. 29 different frigates and boats and all that, only four. 20 different fighter planes, only six. And you can see, the idea of this um, permanent uh, cooperation is to reduce these vast numbers and just concentrate, have one tank, two or three aeroplanes and that, and then they can achieve economies of scale instead of each country doing its own thing, pooling resources. And so this is what PESCO has all been about. And uh, interesting comment made in March, Brexit has indeed been an accelerator the European Defence Fund uh, prepared only five months, that was since Juncker's, uh, Juncker's State of the Union speech, is of an unprecedented scale, both in terms of financial means committed and the perimeter activities envisaged. And at their first meeting in March, um, it was said that, uh, I'm sorry, I pressed that too soon, haven't I? That Britain has to wait until December uh, to see whether she can participate. They wouldn't give a yes or no answer. And, of course, Britain has been very heavily involved in the defence of Europe. But uh, we haven't had to wait till December. The answer came in June when they put together this uh, huge uh, defence fund 
uh, to fund all these activities. And it was made quite clear that America and Britain uh, won't have uh, a share in this 13 billion euro uh, defense fund. Um, and uh, what they said was companies will have to be based in the European Union, have their infrastructure in the European Union, and above all, decision-making cannot be controlled by an entity based outside the European Union. So quite clearly, we're not going to uh, let Britain have a role. We're not going to let America have a role. They're going to do it themselves. That's what they want. That's what they've been working towards. So um, that was the State of the Union speech as uh, the leader of the EU uh, like the Russian leaders and the American leaders, they have their State of the Union uh, speeches uh, every year. And as I say, this was the one where it was depicting him as the Roman emperor uh, talking to his troops, which was so very appropriate. So Macron, again, when his speech uh, had the idea of American, uh, European defence fund, deeper Euro integration, um, a profound transformation of the EU. So they're all speaking the same language. Um, and as the Stratfor article said, both speeches uh, serve their purpose to jumpstart discussions of a deeper integration, outline the grand plans for reformation that Europe so desperately needs. And so they met in this PESCO. Um, see, this is the final step. Uh, territory, if you have an empire, you need territory. Well, they've been in steadily enlarging for the past 60 years. You need seamless borders. Well, they set that up in 1985. You need a common currency. Well, they set that up in 2002. You need a common army. And that's what last year and this year they have been busy doing to build the United States of Europe. And uh, a comment was made that the, they took a major step towards forming a European army when they set up this PESCO. Um, a historic moment in European defence, a milestone in European development. And the speed at which it has gone, this is uh, an Italian writer, it's quite an interesting writer, but he talks about the, the funding being put together at an astonishing speed, a massive arms build-up, bring European forces to the battleground, are on the paper and ready to go. So it's quite an event. And again, this meeting in France, uh, Berlin and Paris would like their alliance to be regarded as the motor for future European integration, the forming of a beast system. And... Uh, the central power structure of the Eurozone. So when we look at a map of Europe and we see the beast and the dragon and the false prophet, and we see the cooperation that there is between all parts, this is fascinating. This didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. This is something which is happening now, that Europe is willing to work with uh, Russia Russia is working with the Pope. Uh, Putin and Pope uh, get on very well together. And the Pope is very much pressing for Europe to develop uh, as a, a, a unity. And uh, he made this uh, comment. that There is uh, a newsletter which comes out uh, every two months. Uh, the Catholic Church in the European Union and the Jesuit European Social Centre, uh, Euroinfos. And it's fairly small print, but Catholics engaging in politics, this was in the latest issue. Italian Catholics were recently invited by Pope Francis to be more engaged in politics. But what did the Pope himself say back last year? He said, Europe's got two choices. It either has to be a federal community or it will no longer count for anything in the world. And what did he mean by a federal community? Well, federal is to act in concert, to unite in a common purpose or belief. So what he was saying was Europe has got to rally together. Rally behind whom? Well, behind the church. This is, you know, the Roman Empire. 
Um, and uh, in the Lisbon Treaty, the Union is obliged to maintain an open, transparent, and regular dialogue with the churches. And you can read into that the Roman Catholic Church because they're more organised and they are continually influencing and having debates and issues uh, guiding the EU as to how they want it to go. This was the cartoon from today's Telegraph. Now, can anybody tell me who this chap is with the catapult? I think it is, yes, because that's the only thing I could see in the paper today. It's Jeremy Hunt says in America, and he said to the Europe, you've got to stand up against Russia. You've got to work with America against Russia. Uh, and, of course, that's the opposite of what Europe wants to hear. And I, I think I'm pretty sure it is him. Um, uh, and Putin is saying, there's the EU flag, you know, I'll protect you. You don't need America. America has got its own axe to grind. I'll look after you. And I think that was so fascinating. As I say, Putin was in Germany uh, this weekend uh, to discuss the second leg of this undersea gas pipeline which flows from Russia into Germany. Uh, very successful. Uh, and they want to double the capacity. Now, a lot of outcry by other non-German members in the EU saying, well, this is going to put power into Germany's pocket. Uh, and Germany says, yes, but, you know, this is a, a it's, well, it's a political thing, it's an economic thing, and we're going to press ahead with it. And, in fact, they've started work on it. Um, so that's an interesting development. But the other interesting thing is... Um, Erdogan is seeking to um, bring Europe together, Russia, Europe uh, and Turkey, to discuss the rebuilding of Syria with the US excluded. Um, and he's planning next month this summit on Syria, whether it'll ever get off the ground. He has lots of wonderful ideas which uh, never do happen, but... It's just interesting, you know, this is picking up the feeling in Europe today. We can look after things ourselves. We can work together uh, and uh, do what we want without having America's interference. So, very briefly, because um, we'll pick this up uh, tomorrow, Brexit, where's it all going? And if you want an answer from me, um, it's not easy. Uh, <laughs> I think the angels have been working overtime to persuade the political powers that the way they're wanting to go, and we know that Mrs May's heart is in, she was a Remainer, she wants to become, remain part of Europe and cling on to Europe. And I think the angels have been so busy throwing this and that and the other at Britain to make them realise you've got to leave, you've got an independent role. And that's why we read from Isaiah 23, because I, I believe this is one of the passages which speaks so eloquently of the role for Britain in the latter days. Now, time is nearly gone, but it's talking about Tyre. And we know that Tyre existed in the time of Isaiah and onwards, Ezekiel came to an end with uh, Nebuchadnezzar trying to break it and didn't succeed, but Alexander the Great succeeding in breaking the power of Tyre. And we know that there has to be a latter-day Tyre. There are so many references to it, so Tarshish and Tyre. But there is the, the clue here um, that her feet shall carry her afar off to Sojourn. She's going to move from where she is on the coasts of uh, Israel to the north to a far-off place. And uh, although one can see connections, and they, they did move and move to Cyprus and onwards like that, it is very clear that uh, at the end of the chapter that uh, the power, there is to be a latter-day power, um, we just go on to the next page here, that the Lord will visit Tyre, turn to her hire, commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth, and her merchandise and the hire shall be holiness to Yahweh, shall not be treasured up, it shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh. 
So it is clear that at the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus, there is to be a Tarshish Tyre power whose energies are going to be used to help bring the Jews back to their land and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order for that power to be there, it's gone through a period of 70 years of being broken, but at the end of that 70-year period is now wanting to commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And that's exactly what we see, that 70 years on from the end of World War II, uh, 70 years and nine months later was the vote to leave, uh, and Britain is determined to be a worldwide power, exactly as uh, Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 21, or God through Isaiah said. But it's not easy. And May is being swallowed up by the EU. And a, a contest between no compromise and no deal. How it's going to end, I don't know, but I anticipate that there will be no deal. And Britain will be able to leave without having to cough up £39 million to pay her indebtedness to the EU and will be able to trade with the countries of the world. And this uh, chappie uh, has said that he will bet his uh, 3.5 billion fortune that Britain will get free trade with the EU under a no-deal Brexit. So he is a man that's uh, expecting that the best deal is going to be a no-deal. So there's no attachment. Britain is free to do what she likes. And it will be up to the EU, because she's got far more to lose than Britain has, to say, yes, uh, Britain can carry on trading um, without any tariffs. But that remains to be seen. It may be a very tumultuous period, or it may be a very smooth. We just don't know. We wait what the angels have in store for Britain. But what's so interesting, that all the things that were predicted uh, would happen haven't happened, and... Britain has been prospering in the past uh, year or so. And interestingly, France, you know, when Macron came to power, uh, he said that, uh, you know, France is back and entrepreneurs will come back to France and technical hubs will sprout up in all French cities and they will move from London to Paris and Paris will be the new financial hub and a start-up nation. Of course, None of that has happened. There's uh, recession, growth has slumped, unemployment is rising, output is down. See, God is in control, not man. And so uh, Britain has a role to play. And interestingly, Nigel Farage is now going on the campaign trail to uh, drive things forward. So we're very close to the end of the negotiations. Um, and we shall just have to see uh, what happens. What is so interesting is that uh, just before the Chequers meeting, where May hammered out her deal, that the EU met and they put forward the, the strategy that they couldn't give way to Britain one iota, um, that uh, what Mrs May was pressing for, though she hadn't finally um, put it into words, that was going to be the following day. But uh, this Michael Barnier's senior economic advisor said that uh, we can't give any concessions to Britain. It will hurt us if we do. And so you know, they made it quite clear that whatever Mrs May wants and plans, they're not going to accept it. So, just final slide, and time has gone. So, we're seeing Britain taking an independent course there. We're seeing how these nations are cooperating, as we would expect, when the image has to stand upon its feet. We're not there yet. The Lord Jesus will come back, and the final forming of the feet will take place so that the image can stand to come against Israel. But such exciting times, brothers and sisters, to be able to see so much in the past 12 months since our last meeting here at Brecon, so much has happened. Things that my father you know, anticipated and talked about but never got to see, and we have seen them. So, brothers and sisters, let's be alert, let's be watchful. The hand of God is working there.